We turn now to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. In the previous verses we were considering last week something of the greatness of the salvation that has come to us through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the true grace of God. Peter says in 1 Peter 5.12 we are told to stand firm in it. This grace which the prophets of old prophesied about. 1 Peter 1.10 Something that was yet in the future. Something that we were to experience in Christ which nobody under the Old Testament could ever experience. Which made Jesus say that the least person in the kingdom of God was greater than the greatest of Old Testament people, John the Baptist. This grace which has now come to us through Jesus and which has brought to us such a tremendous salvation which the Old Testament prophets could not experience, which the angels in heaven seek to understand and which they have not experienced, since we have inherited this, we who are so privileged. Therefore, verse 13, Peter says, Gird your minds for action or brace up your minds. Be sober and fix your hope completely on the grace that is yet to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are told that the salvation that comes through Jesus is something that leads us from grace to greater grace. There is more grace that is going to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we are saved initially and are born of God, that is by grace, forgiveness of sins through the riches of His grace. But that's only the beginning. Then we are to experience grace that enables us to overcome sin, Romans 6.14. Grace that is sufficient for every need that we can ever face in our earthly life, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. And here we are told of a further grace that is to be ours at the return of Jesus Christ when he's finally revealed and unveiled and we are to hope fully for that and experience more and more grace between now and then but this is not going to come to us automatically and that's clearly taught in that verse for we are told to gird up our minds for action and to keep sober in spirit in other words we are to look forward soberly, seriously, and intelligently, and using our minds set on the things that are above, to expect grace from God, and thus to obey. Again, he speaks about the same obedience that he had spoken of in verse 2. He says in verse 14, as obedient children... Live as obedient children before God and not being molded by the desires of our ignorant days. Conform to the former lusts in the days of our ignorance. That is, when we didn't know about this grace from God, we did not know about this salvation that could deliver us from sin's power. In those days in our ignorance, we lived according to our lusts. Now notice here that Peter is not speaking about forgiveness of sins at all. Forgiveness of sins is something the Old Testament prophets experienced. But he's speaking about here about that grace which the Old Testament prophets did not experience but prophesied as something that was yet in the future. Something beyond forgiveness of sins. Something that would lead us to obedience to God's commandments. That's Peter's burden. And this is the true grace of God, he says in 1 Peter 5.12, that which leads to obedience. And so he speaks about obedience in verse 14. Be obedient children, or children of obedience is the literal translation. Just like the children of Adam are called the children of disobedience in Ephesians 2 and verse 2. Here is the contrast, children of disobedience and children of obedience. He says, now that you are no longer ignorant, don't again be molded by your former lusts. Don't let those lusts shape your personality. But let the grace of God deliver you from those lusts. Be obedient to God's word so that your personality is shaped in the image of Christ henceforth. And so it says in verse 15, don't let 
the former lust shape you, but like the Holy One who has called you is holy. Be holy yourselves. So here's the contrast. There are two molds into which my personality can be poured. One is the mold of my former lusts, the figure of Adam. The other is the mold of the nature of God that is seen in Christ. And if I am to be poured into this mold, I have to obey. If I obey each time God calls me to, and I seek for grace to obey, then I shall become holy, verse 15, like the one who has called me is holy. To read another translation, it reads like this. Don't let your character be molded by the desires of your ignorant days, but be holy in every part of your lives. For the one who has called you is himself holy. That's the point. That since we are now the children of one who is holy, we are to be holy in every aspect of our personality. It says in verse 15, in all your behavior, in everything that we do, holiness must characterize our actions, our words, our thoughts, our attitudes and our motives. And what is the reason for this? Here it is in verse 16. Because the one who has called us, our heavenly Father, is holy. And he has written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Here is the fundamental reason why we should be holy. Because we are children of a Father whose primary and essential characteristic is holiness. And we are given a spirit who is called the Holy Spirit. And therefore, Peter goes on to say in verse 17, if you are going to say our Father to this one who is holy and who judges everyone impartially according to each man's work, then it is essential that during the entire time of your stay upon this earth, you conduct yourself in reverential fear. Remember this, that God is impartial. That means he's got no favorites. It doesn't matter who it is who sins. Sin drives us out of God's presence. God has to turn his face away from us and break fellowship with us when we sin. Now, two of the clearest examples of this are in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned just once. That sin was enough to turn them out of the Garden. God, who created them, loved them, turned them out when they sinned. The other example of it we see in the cross of Calvary where Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, hung on the cross, not for his own sins, but for the sins of the world, the Father turned away his face. And so we see that God is impartial. And whether sin is found in a man who calls himself a believer or an unbeliever, God's attitude to sin is always the same. He has to break fellowship wherever sin is found. And that is why this word is written even to believers in Romans 8.13. If you, being believers, now live after the flesh, you shall die eternally, without a doubt, because the Father who judges you has got no favorites. Therefore, conduct yourself in fear during the entire time of your life on earth. It's very important that from the beginning to the end of our Christian life, we conduct ourselves in the fear of God. We're told about Jesus in the days of his flesh, Hebrews 5, 7. He prayed with strong crying and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And that death was the death that is a result of living after the flesh, which Jesus never wanted to enter into, but he sought for help from his Father and never entered into that death. But he was heard because of his godly fear. In the days of his flesh, Jesus conducted himself in reverential fear, and we are called to follow in his footsteps every moment of our life to conduct ourselves in reverential fear of God. And then we shall keep ourselves from sin 
and experience grace to obey his commandments.